the key text that we're going to use tonight is Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The whole theme of this week of prayer for your conference is about, you know, inspire one. It's basically saying each one of us needs to reach someone else. We need to inspire each other to encourage each other to reach one. And I'm um, going to talk about that tonight. This could be more of a con conversation than uh, a beat the pulpit <laughs> kind of sermon. Uh, but I hope I hope you find a blessing. And by the way, it's a great honor uh, to be a part of this, this week of spiritual emphasis. Um, so back to our, our Bible text, Luke chapter 4, verses 18, 19. The first words, inspired words, it says this, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Now explain that. Explain that. It's that the person writing in the Bible says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. Is on me. How, how do you know the spirit of God is on you? Have you ever felt or sensed that the spirit of God is on you? You know, sometimes I think we have. If you reflect on your own life, there's moments where you're maybe with someone and they're asking you a hard Bible question. And all of a sudden you have a, a really pretty good answer. And you know that you're not that sharp. <laughs> you're not that bright to have a good answer. It, it must be the spirit of the Lord is on you, right? You know, I remember one time a young man came to my office. He and I were good friends. We could be honest with each other. Uh, you know, when you're a good friend, you can be honest. And uh, he came in my office. I hadn't seen him in a, oh, a couple of years. And uh, it's great to see him. Before COVID, we hugged one another and and talked and, you know, had a good time chatting. And and eventually I asked him, how's your walk with God? And he kind of shrugged his shoulders, you know, um, which is a signal that says, <laughs> not so good. <laughs> I think we all get this. And, uh, yeah, you know, he says, it could be better. I said, could it be worse? Yeah, it could be worse. And uh, I said, well, talk to me. Where, where are you going to church right now? And he looked back at me and he says, well, I don't know. I, um, uh, what that means is he's not going to church right now. <laughs> I don't, when you say, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I said, uh, but Hey, I understand you're in a community with about, you know, eight, 12 different church options within probably 40, 40 minute drive. I mean, you, you got a lot of churches around you. Uh, why don't you, uh, why don't you choose one? Just try one, you know, test drive it, you know, get in community. Because in community, we can inspire, encourage each other, keep each other accountable. And uh, he says, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I said, well, how about this church? Because I knew there are many young adults there. It was a friendly church. It was um, one of my favorites to visit because it it was a core congregation. <laughs> and I knew what values it, it was, uh, you know, presenting and believed in. And he said, oh, no, I, I don't know. I just, not right now. I said, come on. Come on, tell me. Why why is it you aren't going to church? What's going on? Be, be open. Come on, come on, you can talk to me. He looked back at me. And uh, with a voice that got pretty weak, he says, uh, I, I can't go to church. I said, yes, you can. I said, there's a lot of people there, you know? I mean, they're all on journeys. They're all challenged. He said, I, no, no, Pastor. He says, uh, Pastor Ron, I, I, I can't go to church right now. I said, why not? Tell me, why not? He says, uh, I, I, uh, I can't quit smoking. I said, what? You're not going to church because... This thing tobacco's got a hold of you? Yeah, he says, that, that's it. That's right. I, uh, I I can't go to church right now. I, I don't want to embarrass anyone. I don't, I don't want people to smell me. I don't want, I'm embarrassed that I can't get rid of this habit. Um, I, I just, it's just not, I, I can't go to church. It, it's not right to go to church and have this problem. 
You know, it's just not right. And do you remember the thought that I shared with you? It says, um, the spirit of the Lord was on me. At this moment, I'm here to tell you, the spirit of the Lord was on me. The person talking to you right now. And the spirit of the Lord gave me words that was way beyond my giftedness, my natural abilities. Um, I looked back at him. I says, you, you don't go to church because you, you're dealing with tobacco, right? Smoking, yeah. Yeah, he said, yeah, that's right. I said, do you know what? That big church that I told you, or that church, I should say, that I want you to go to, that I know a lot of the people there, and they would love on you and, and everything. They're not perfect either. You know, they, they're, they got their struggles. Sometimes we know that God is near us. This was that moment for me. When the young man looked at me, says, I can't go to church. And he explained it's because he's struggling with tobacco. I explained to him, you need to go to this church because I know it's a loving church, has core values at the at the center of it. And uh, I explained to him, you want me to tell you why you need to go to that church? He said, yeah, explain that, you know, because we're good enough friends. He could, we, I was pushing him and he's pushing back. Yeah, why would I want to go explain that? I, I don't want to embarrass myself. I don't want to embarrass them. You know, they smell the tobacco. I could put cologne on or whatever. But I said, the reason you need to go is because when you walk through the door of that church, if you could smell every sin, if sin was an odor, a smell, if you could smell <laughs> all the sin that's in that congregation, it would be one smelly place. I said, you need to go to church and we'll, you know, You'll work through this thing, this tobacco thing. You need to be in community. You need to get to the church. He looked back with me at me and tears came into his eyes. He says, I get it. I do. I miss church. I miss community. I miss worship. I'm going to go to church. And that was a moment for me when the spirit of the Lord was on me. And I knew what I said, what I spoke was not my words, it was God's words. And as we think about this whole thing about being a witness, being a testimony, you know, inspire one, inspire each other to inspire others to know Jesus. As we think about that, I believe the people that are hearing this message, I say to you, there's moments that you will know that God is speaking through you because <laughs> because you know it's not your words, it's the Spirit's words. And I just want to keep reading the Bible text and reflect on the next thought. It says, because he, speaking of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, has anointed you. So it says, the Spirit of the Lord is on you, on me, because he's anointed me. Now, last summer at the Camporee, we tried something we've never tried before in Oshkosh. As you might know, we had 55,000 people there. We had our own Pathfinder City. Uh, we had our own radio station, our newspaper. We had our own newspaper, had our own medical team, fire department. We Anything your city has, we had at Oshkosh. We had a Pathfinder City. And at this city, with uh, 55,000 people, 105 countries, we had something brand new that we offered Pathfinder leaders. We told them, why don't you bring your outstanding young people, people that are seeking and following Jesus, bring them to the prayer tent, and we will offer them anointing. And anointing, as you might know, in the Bible is when someone is blessed, set aside, pointed out, encouraged uh, to live a life separate from things of the planet. And I'm here to tell you, those that are listening, uh, there we couldn't believe it. People lined up at 6 a.m. for a 9 a.m. anointing service. There are young people and adults brought young people to the prayer and anointing tent by the hundreds. We couldn't believe it. We thought maybe just a few would come. 
But this thing called anointing is spoken about in the Bible text tonight, Luke 4, 18, 19. It says, the spirit of the Lord is on you, on me, because he's anointed me. He's anointed you. That means he's set us aside. He's told us how special we are. And we have a destiny beyond the planet. We have a destiny to tell others about things to come, heaven and the love of Jesus. But you know what? When we're little kids growing up, like in elementary school, if you can go back in time with me, I'm going to share with you a little personal story about myself. When I was growing up in elementary school, I didn't think I was anything special. I definitely wasn't anointed by the Lord. I, 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 didn't, I had a self-esteem uh, image that wasn't very positive. I'll tell you why. is because I had a, a disability, and it's called dyslexia. Dyslexia is when you read words backwards. So you're reading a book, and, and, and as you read the sentence, the words jump around or they, you start reading things backwards. Even to this day, I can, <laughs> I can uh, speak words backwards very easy. And back there in elementary school, I remember the teacher had a stand, right? We stood up and I remember she says, okay, you read this sentence. And then, Manuel, you read the second sentence, sentence and, and Hugo, why don't you take the third? And Ron, why don't you take the fourth sentence? And I remember in this small little classroom I was in, um, it got closer and closer to me. I got more and more nervous. And with dyslexia, when you get really nervous, the words jump around even more. <laughs> if you know what I'm saying, maybe somebody... Uh, understands what I'm talking about. And when it got to me, of course, the teacher didn't understand this. I don't think she was a mean teacher, but she said, okay, Ron, why don't you read and stand up? So I stood up, I started reading and the words jumped all over the page. I butchered the words. All the people around me, the students around me started laughing. And at that time in elementary school, I thought they were laughing at me. Being in a different stage of life, a different part of life, I think they might have been laughing with me, nervous for me, uh, but no doubt there were some laughing at me because I sounded stupid. So my personal self-esteem, my personal self-image was anything uh, but positive at this point in my life. But, you hear me? There was somebody in my life that was a champion for me. Someone believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And this person was my mom. You know, earlier in the program tonight, I heard a young man give testimony how he's still being a witness in his community with his family. And I remember him referring to his mother as a great influence in his life. Our moms are special. We're blessed. Many of us are blessed to have amazing moms. My mom told me that, that I was going to go to college and that we're going to work through this academic challenge that I had because when I would take tests, uh, there's a time limit and my grades were very bad. In fact, just to be honest with this group, is that if I got I remember the teacher going to the chalkboard. She put letter A up top. Here's 95, 99, you know, 94, a draw line. And then the Bs are 88, 86, 84, 83. Draw another line. The Cs are 78, you know, 75, 76. Draw another line. And you know what comes next, right? The Ds, 68, 62. And, of course, below that in the 50s is the F as they get into my teacher in my small school, I know she didn't do this on purpose. I, I just choose to believe that. But I remember in our small classroom of only about 15, 12 to 15 students, she would always put the grades on the blackboard from A to D and sometimes F. She would start handing out the papers to us as students the test and 
she always started with the A's and ended with the F's or the D's. I remember a friend of mine, Mark and myself, he was struggling academically. I was struggling academically. We both were praying that we had a D grade, not an F grade. I mean, we maybe, I'm sure there's people tonight that they don't understand what I'm talking about. They've never struggled like this, but there's others that you get it. You understand exactly what I'm talking about. I, I, I just, I was just not doing well academically. And I remember when one test uh, a grade with 99 on it was handed to a, a young man named Steve. And as soon as it dropped to the, his desk, he says, what a 99. Ah, if I would have studied, I could have had a hundred and everybody laughed. Right. And I thought to myself, oh, boy, I would like to not have to study and have a 99. <laughs> I mean, he was a bright guy and all, and he knew he was bright and he liked to tell everybody how bright he was. Lesson. I learned, you know, if you're good at something, you don't have to go around telling somebody else all the time how good you are at it. Just let, just let your, as the, that's the song, let your light shine. Just be who you are in the context of who your best friend is, and that's Jesus. Well, as I went through elementary school, I didn't feel like I was special. I didn't feel like, as the Bible text says, I was anointed for anything. I thought I was a disaster. I would even use the word of my mom, say I'm a loser. And I know you want me to go to college, but I'll never go to college. I, it just, I can't even get out of elementary school. Mom, I can't even. I can't, I don't do good with spelling. I can't read well. I, I, I'm a disaster, I, you know? And then one day, the teacher, and again, I don't think it was a bad teacher. She didn't mean it in a bad way. I really choose to believe that. She walked up to my desk after she had put a, a grade uh, test paper on my desk. And she tapped me on the back. She says, Ronnie, you know, you're a, you're a good young man. Yeah, you, you know, there's... You, you have a future, but you'll never go to college. And when she said that, at home, I hear my mom saying, I am going to college. But here's a respected person that I, in my life, my teacher, says, I'm not going to college. And so when I went home that day, I remember coming through the front door and I was perplexed. I have these double messages going on in my life about I'm going to accomplish this. And another person say I'm not. And, and you know how moms can pick up our facial expressions, maybe our shoulder posture. I don't know how they do it. They're moms, right? It's a God thing that moms have. She looks at me and said, hey, what, what went wrong today at school? I said, oh, nothing. That's yeah, a standard answer, right? Um, nothing. She said, no, what, what went wrong for you today? Something didn't work out. And I said, no, it's not a big deal. She says, you got it. And she says, sit down. You know how moms can zero in on you? So I sat down and she says, okay, what happened? She says, well, you know how you tell me I'm going to go to college someday? And she says, yeah, you are. And I said, well, my teacher told me today, I'm not going to college. Oh, 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 boy. Um, you know, when moms get excited about something, their eyes kind of turn on, you know, and, and and I don't know how to explain it. Their facial expression kind of turns. You, and what I saw in my mom was this resolve that I was going to college and what the teacher said was not appropriate. She says to me, my mom, you're special. You've been made special by God. The spirit is on you. You've been anointed by the spirit ever since you were a little boy. There's a special plan and purpose for your life. And uh, I want you to know, you need to know that. Well, the next day, I don't know how my mom got from my home to the teacher, uh, 
But somehow they had must have had a conversation. Because when I walked into the classroom the very next day, the teacher uh, rushes up to me and says, Hey, Ronnie, glad you're here today. And by the way, I can't wait to prepare you for college. <laughs> I, I said to myself, oh, where did that come from? And then I thought, hmm, I wonder if she had spoken to my mom. So my mom believed in me when no one else believed in me. And she gave me stability when no one else gave me stability. And I just thank God for that mom in my life. And in the context of our theme tonight, inspire one, each one reach one, let's encourage each one to reach out to others. I would encourage you with this thought, no matter what your skill sets are, how articulate you are with words or not, how bright you are or not, or how uh, good you are with money or not, or what, just go through the list, right? You are a child of the king. You have a special purpose for your life and you have an assignment from heaven to reach other people with the love of Jesus. As our theme talks about, we're inspired to reach one. Each one can reach one, each of us tonight. The other Bible texts, the words that are explained here, it says, the spirit of the Lord is on you, it's on me. Because he's anointed you, he's anointed me, is what the Bible text says. He says, proclaim the good news. Proclaim the good news to the poor. Well, the poor can be people that are compromised economically, financially, but also sometimes the poor is someone that has a low self-esteem, somebody that's in your classroom or in your neighborhood that's being bullied, someone that is in a home situation where they don't have a mom or a dad like I had that's an encourager, but they're a mom or a dad or someone in their life that's a discourager that tells it you're a loser, you're not going to, you're not good for nothing. You know, when the Bible text tells us we're to play, proclaim the good news to the poor, you know, the poor is not just the economic poor, but this could be someone that's poor in self esteem poor in self-image, and you, those that are listening right now, you can influence someone else in this area and make sure, by the way, the best self-esteem you can have is in a relationship with Jesus. Then you don't worry about the clothes you wear, the car you drive, where you live, what type of job title you have. Your self-esteem doesn't come from things of the planet. Your self-esteem comes from where? It comes from heaven, your relationship with Jesus. So the Bible text says the spirit of the Lord is on you. He's anointed you. He wants you to proclaim, the Bible text says, the good news to the poor. That's for sure the people that are compromised financially. But that could be other people that are compromised in their self-image, that are beat up by the world and people around them. The Bible text says, I that he sent you and me to proclaim freedom to people that are trapped and imprisoned. And that's not just people in physical prisons, but people trapped in the prison of drugs or alcohol, people that are struggling with pornography. Come on. Uh, they're addicted to novels. You know, this whole virus, C virus thing, you know, I found some friends there. I talked to they're they're feeding their soul, their mind with movies and things that are compromised their walk with God. And it bothers me. I remember a few years ago, uh, my son, Ryan, he was on the computer at the, our house and we had it in a public area, our computer. And he, uh, he was watching some, um, information that was coming into my computer in, in the common place in our home. And it says, hello from Russia, uh, the message. So he thought, well, I'm running a camporee. Maybe it's, it's somebody in Russia that wants saying hi to his dad, you know, and, and wants more information about the international camporee. So he opened it. He opened the screen. 
And then I heard him cry out. I was in the, in, in the same room, across the room. He cried out and says, oh, no. Oh, no. And I says, Ryan, what's the matter? What's the matter? He says, I didn't want to see that. I didn't want to see it. What he saw, as you understand, was, was something that, you know, addicts many young men, some women. But this thing called pornography is a very destructive thing that the adversaries put accessible to everyone now because of the Internet. He cried out, oh, no. <clears throat> and he says, I don't want to see that. I don't want that in my mind. I don't want that picture in my mind. And it, it, that day I, I understood that as much as I tried to protect our home, I had filters on my computer, that evil is a great controversy has come to my family. And when I look at this Bible text about us being a testimonial witness, I challenge all of us on this listening to this presentation, don't don't uh, become prisoners of trapped in things of this world. And you know what I'm talking about. You know the things that you're struggling with. There are certain movies you shouldn't be watching. There are certain places you shouldn't go. There are certain things you shouldn't be putting in your body. You know what I'm talking about. You and the Holy Spirit can talk. And you, you, can, you can figure that out. Well... The Bible text that we're studying tonight continues on. And it explains that, yeah, the Spirit is on us. We've been anointed to tell and proclaim the good news, uh, the good news about freedom and, you know, the hope of the future. And the Bible text goes on to, to point out uh, that, you know, we offer we can offer sight to people that are who are blind and, and that's what we can do through the gospel and you know what that's all about it's not just blind physically but it's blind spiritually it might have something to do people that are blind about race or culture or justice they're blind about relating to other people's feelings they're blind to their own pride and their their own self, you know, as we think about being a testimony, a witness, inspiring each other to win one for Jesus, we need to reflect on our own lives to make sure we're not blind to things that the adversary, the evil one that's put in our lives to make us stumble. The Bible text continues. It says uh, that, you know, we, the Lord is a part of our lives. And there's a whole year where the Lord shares favor on us. The Bible writer talks about that. And um, I, I love this Bible text selected for this week of spiritual emphasis. Luke 4, 18 and 19. It tells me that Spirit of the Lord is with us. He's anointed us. We have good news for those that are trapped in prison. Uh, those that are trapped that can't see, they're blind. And we should be proclaiming to others a way out of those entrapments, those compromises. I'll close with this story. It's a personal story again. But I think it illustrates exactly what I want to remind us that's so important to us tonight as we embrace this theme about using our lives to inspire people to know Jesus, inspire them to know something better than what they know right now. My son, Ryan, was a little tiny boy. I just read him a Bible story from the book of Revelation. In the Bible story, it says there's 10,000 times 10,000 angels coming back for you, Ryan. My son's name is Ryan. And when Ryan gets excited, he's in bed, there. I'm reading the Bible story to him. He got up on his elbow. And when Ryan gets excited, his eyes get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I remember this particular night, his eyes got huge, like a half dollar. I mean, it just, 
he was so excited to think there's 10,000 times 10,000 angels coming back for him. But he's only, you know, I think he's only like six years old or so, uh, five and a half, six. And I said, Ryan, do you know how many angels that is? He looks back at me and with excitement in his voice, he says, no, dad, I don't know. How many angels is 10,000? I said, that's a hundred million angels coming back for you and me, Ryan, because Jesus loves us so much. And then Ryan said what every father wants to hear his son say, what every pastor wants to hear his members say. What he said to me, he said, Daddy, Daddy, Jesus is coming back for me, right? I said, yeah, we'll be caught up in the air. The Bible said we'll be caught up in the air. He says, Daddy, and with enthusiasm in his voice, he says to me, Daddy, I'm ready to fly. I'm ready to fly. And I thought to myself, he gets it. Ryan at age six, he gets it. He's ready to fly. So what I say to you tonight, are you ready to fly? If the roof above you right now opened up and the Lord Jesus Christ came back for us, would you be ready to fly? And if your answer is yes, what are you doing with your testimony? What are you doing to make sure others are prepared for the return of Jesus? And if your answer tonight is no, I'm not ready to fly. I, I, I got some things. I, I don't have that relationship with Jesus. Well, tonight is the night. Today's the day. This moment is the moment for you to remind yourself that the Spirit of the Lord is on you. He's anointed you. He loves you unconditionally. And I encourage you to rededicate your life to Jesus or give your life to Jesus for the very first time. Just pray the sinner's, sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer, just, you know, I'm a mess. I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a Savior. Please forgive my sins. And Jesus will do just that. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's what your Savior can do for you. So to that end, looking forward to the return of Jesus, let me pray for you right now. Father God, thank you for this Bible text, Luke 4, 18 and 19. Thank you that the Spirit of the Lord is on us, that you've anointed us, that we have a special purpose for our life. And when we get trapped in our own prisons, we get blind to our own challenges and struggles, we can come to you, Lord, and give them to you, and you can help us through them. And Father, help us to find someone this week that we can be a testimony to, a witness to, an encouragement to. And to that end, as we said at the beginning of this prayer, looking forward to your return, we pray this prayer, and all the people said, Looking forward to your return. In Jesus' name, amen.